Okay, good afternoon, everyone. We will go ahead and get started now. My name is Cindy Cordova, and I am a Senior Assistant Director within the Board of Admissions here at BC, and I'm joined by my colleague, Kaylin. I'm going to let her introduce herself. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited to have you here for our session on how college decisions are made dissecting the application. And we will be taking questions and answers throughout the session as well. So please feel free to use the question and answer box. And uh, we're so excited to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. It is important for you to know that this session is being recorded and we will post the recording within a few days on the Discover Boston College page, which is the same page that you use to sign up for this session. Um, we also want to take this time to acknowledge the difficult situation that people are living all over the world due to the global pandemic. Our thoughts are with you and with your family members, and we certainly understand that this is a very difficult and different year for those of you who are thinking into applying at BC, uh, looking at the application process, and the inability to be able to visit campus as our campus remains closed to visitors during this time. Please know that our approach at BC, and in particular with the undergraduate admissions office, is to be flexible and understanding of what you're going through. And so we hope that this session will certainly answer many questions that you have. And of course, it is just the beginning of the conversation. Uh, we hope that you can reach out to us with any questions. And just to get us started here, as Kaylin said, please include your questions in the Q&A box. You can do so right now as we get started. We have a, an incredible team uh, looking at these questions and help, helping us answer the questions as we go along with the presentation. And we'll have some time towards the end of the presentation to address some of these questions live as well. But just to give you some context about Boston College, Boston College is a private research and liberal arts institution located around six miles west of downtown Boston, America's college town. We welcome students from all 50 states and around 78 countries from around the world. So it's definitely a very global campus community. We're also a Jesuit Catholic university. Now you don't have to be Catholic in order to apply to BC, nor to be a student here, but certainly the values of a Jesuit education inform the holistic approach to education that we take here. One of the models that we like to observe is cura personalis in Latin. And this translates to educating the whole person. So not only educating your mind, but also helping you connect to your heart, your soul, your purpose in life. What makes you come alive? The second model that we have is men and women for others, which engages you into giving back uh, through community service, through social justice causes, and also being able to think again about your purpose. It is very common for our students to engage in questions like, what brings you joy? What are you good at? And what does the world need you to be as you're thinking about the kind of person that you want to become? Now here's an overview of our class of 2024 profile. So the recent class of incoming freshmen who are studying at BC. And as you can see, we received around 29,383 applications for a freshman class of 2,408 seats. For here at BC, we have early decision and regular decision, and around 37% was the acceptance rate for our students who applied through early decision one and two combined. 24% was the acceptance rate for regular decision. So as you can see, early decision is certainly becoming a very popular option for our high school students who are looking at BC in terms of the application process. The students who make, make up the class of 2024 have an average GPA of around an A to A minus unweighted GPA in the most rigorous program available at their high schools. And when we're looking at centralized testing for this past year's class, the middle 50% of students had a range of 1400 to 1520 on the SAT and a range of 33 to 35 on the ACT when it came down to the middle 50%. 
Now, one of the things that I love being part of the admissions office here at BC is that we have a very holistic review, a review that is comprehensive, a review that is also contextual. We know that you are multi-layered, multifaceted, and, and thus we are reviewing your application accordingly. We know that we're going to get a lot of information from your personal statements, your stories, as well as our recommendation letters to see what others have to say about you beyond the transcript and beyond the test scores. We are really engaged in looking at you as a whole person in alignment with our models here at BC. We also, as you can see, have quantitative pieces of the application and qualitative pieces of the application that we will be reviewing today as part of this presentation. So when it comes down to the review process and that holistic realm, we're looking at the transcript and, and standardized testing as part of the quantitative metrics that we um, are assessing. And then we look at your essays, your recommendation letters, your extracurricular activities, as well as any additional factors that come from your background, your life st story, and the context of your surroundings um, as part of the qualitative pieces of the application. So let's break the these uh, aspects down a little bit more so that you understand how it is that we review applications. First and foremost, here at BC, we accept the common application as well as the QuestBridge application. And when you're applying to BC, we would ask you to select one out of the four academic divisions that we have here. And those are the Morris College of Arts and Sciences, the Carroll School of Management, the Lynch School of Education and Human Development, and finally, the Connell School of Nursing. Now, when we're looking at your transcript, we actually receive a school profile from your, high, from your high school and your counselors. And that school profile outlines the classes that you have available at your school. We know that there is a lot of curricula out there. Some of you might have access to honors classes or AP classes, international baccalaureate, French baccalaureate, German abattoir, just to name a few. There's so much out there. But certainly our team here is very well versed uh, with over 20 years of experience all together, uh, being able to engage in, in, in reviewing the school profile and reviewing your transcripts accordingly. So when I'm opening up a school profile, for instance, and opening up your transcript, I'm asking myself the question, how has this student been able to take advantage of the classes available at their school? Never comparing you to students who are taking classes within the same town or the same state or country. It really is within the context of your high school. And we're looking at the rigor of the classes available from ninth grade all the way through your senior year. Sometimes when I'm talking to students and I ask them the question, what do you think is the most important year in high school? I often get the answer, 11th grade. And of course, 11th grade is very important because that tends to be the year when you have access to those higher level classes. But 12th grade is also important. So don't fall for senioritis. Uh, don't get caught up in that because certainly we are looking for updated grades that we receive in terms of your senior year as well. We also look at your grade trends. So again, from ninth grade all the way through your senior year, what has been your performance? What has been happening in terms of your grades? And that, that is also within the context of your high school and how your high school is um, reporting those grades to us and in, in which scales. So sometimes I notice upward trends when it comes to grades or maybe downward trends or maybe, or maybe a little bit of ups and downs, some dips. Um, and certainly life happens. So we understand that it can't all be perfect out there and it shouldn't be. And we understand that we want you to create some kind of balance and you're doing a lot more than just taking classes in the classroom. But certainly these are things that we're looking for. Sometimes your schools will also report rank. Um, and so they will pro provide that information on the transcript for us or on the school profile. And certainly if that is something that your school is doing, that if they're reporting, we certainly take into account rank as well. But at the end of the day, there is context that we need to review. And there's also space for you on the application for you to share if you want to explain anything at all regarding your transcript. I wish the transcript could speak back to me or to Caitlin, but it certainly does not. So we really need you to advocate for yourself, to feel empowered in this process, and to share any context related to your grades or your transcript that you would like for the Board of Admissions to know. 
Next, we're looking at standardized testing. And for my seniors joining this call, we have gone test optional here at BC for the SAT and the ACT. So certainly understanding the circumstances that you're in with many of these tests getting canceled or there being some glitches, we're very understanding and we don't want to add more pressure to this process. So you will have to decide whether or not you want to send in those scores if you have them available. I would encourage you to look at the middle 50%. Um, here at BC, which I can again reference. So again, for the class of 2024, the middle 50% of students who were admitted had an SAT range of 1400 to 1520 and an ACT range of 33 to 35. So if you took these tests and you're falling within those ranges, you're certainly in a very competitive spot to send in those scores. If you're a little bit below 1400, a little bit below 33, certainly feel free to ask us questions and connect with us so that we can guide you accordingly. But if you're falling very much below in that spectrum when it comes to those test scores within the context of BC and our middle 50%, then we probably would encourage you to not send in those scores because again, we are in a test optional uh, model here at BC for this year and we do want for you to be in the best possible space uh, that is to your advantage when it comes to the review process. There will be a question on the Common App as well, asking you if you will be submitting test scores for, for the review process or not. So if you let us know that you're not going to be sending in test scores, then that's it. We move on to the next of uh, the, the other pieces of the review process. Um, we won't be asking you to send those in if you're letting us know that you, you will not be sending them as part of the review process. Again, because we are following the test optional model. Now, English proficiency tests are still required. So if English is not your first language or the language of instruction at the high school, uh, you'll see that one of the items on the checklist will be the English proficiency test. And so we accept the TOEFL, the IELTS, and the Duolingo English test. Recommended minimums are here on the screen, as you can see, 100 IBT total for the TOEFL, 7.5 for IELTS, and 125 minimum for the Duolingo English test. There are also ways for you to be able to uh, request waivers from the Board of Admissions after having submitted your application so that the Board of Admissions can assess if we're able to grant waivers. And that's also outlined on our website, so we would certainly encourage you to check out the website for more information regarding uh, waivers for English proficiency tests. And now I believe we're gonna move into the qualitative pieces of the application. So I'm gonna turn it over to Caitlin to walk us through, the, through that process. Thank you so much, Cindy, for all that wonderful information. It's so great to learn about the quantitative side of how we review our applications. And I just wanna, Thank you again for um, highlighting all of those different pieces. And I think that as we look at how we review applications that especially this year, but also in years past, something that can cause students a lot of stress and anxiety would be um, the personal essay and the writing supplement that they might have to put forward. And I think especially in this year with all of the uncertainty that students have faced, um, there are some things that you really should know about how we review our applications holistically and what we look at in the essay section. So for Boston College, we ask that you please have your personal statement as part of the common application. So you will have had that already done, but then Boston College also does have its own writing supplement. And there are four questions that go along with it. And one thing that I would just uh, really encourage you to think about as you are writing uh, your writing supplements and your essays. Um, I remember when I was in high school, <laughs> it was like the summer right before senior year started. And I felt like maybe in August there was this feeling like everywhere I went, so everyone wanted to ask me what I was writing my essay on, or they were telling me what they were writing their essay on, and I didn't quite know yet. So I do remember that feeling of just not quite knowing how to approach it, and it, it does take a little bit of time to really be thoughtful and think about what you would like the Board of Admission to know about you um, when you're putting forward uh, those writing samples. So what I would just say is that because we don't offer interviews at Boston College, your essays are really that number one time that we're getting a sense of who you are and what you're like. So you want to make sure that your voice is coming through, even though we're seeing all those different facts and figures in your application, 
this is really that time to introduce yourself in that more personal way. So if you're funny, by all means, you can be funny in your essays. But if you are not funny, this is not the time to start, okay? It really should be uh, how your voice is authentically. And because we don't have that opportunity to interview you, you are really getting a, a chance to meet us through these essays. And so you just wanna remember that there is another person on that side uh, when you submit those essays and you want your voice to be as clear and as authentic as possible. And with that being said, I would also say, I know it sounds silly, we're in 2020, we have uh, autocorrect, we have spell check, we have all of those tools available to us when we're writing, but I would just keep in mind that you wanna make sure that your spelling and grammar are as perfect as they possibly can be, because you don't want there to be any confusion about what you're trying to say. Every single year, I will read essays that uh, talk about wanting to study abroad instead of studying abroad. <laughs> and I think just when we're, when we're reading all these essays and we're looking at it, you, you really don't want there to have to be a second reason to go back and read your essay because maybe something doesn't make sense. Um, and the other thing too is that you really wanna think about the question and what it is asking you. For something like the supplemental essay especially, this is a chance for you to be able to talk about why you and Boston College are a good fit for each other. And so reading through the questions, because there are four that are available, you want to think about how you would like to answer that in a thoughtful and reflective way. Because I can tell you every single year when I'm reading through applications, sometimes I will go through a student's application and I'm so excited to get to the writing supplement where it should be about, um, I would say about 400 words where students can talk about why they, uh, why BC and you are a good fit for each other. And that's really the underlying question of many of those um, questions that we have. There's also um, one on Jesuit values, great art, um, or if you could design your own class, what would it be and why? And I'm excited for this, you know, really thoughtful answer about Boston College. And then I open it up and the student has written two lines and it says something like, um, I really want to go to Boston College because it's in Boston and I love the Boston Red Sox. And that's all it says. And that's just, you know, that's a point where you can really show that you've done your homework on Boston College, but also that you're really enthusiastic um, about the questions that we've put and posed in that supplemental section. So those are my piece of, pieces of advice for the writing section. Um, and I would just say take your time so that you can put uh, your best foot forward when it comes to writing those essays. All right. So the other thing to keep in mind um, is that there are some materials that we will ask as supporting mater material for you. Um, there is the school report and counselor recommendation. So we do require a couple of letters of recommendation um, in your application. So especially in this era of, you know, everyone being virtual for a time or maybe you're still virtual or maybe your school is trying to still figure out how they are going to go forward in this year. I know that it's created a lot of anxiety and stress about grading scales may have changed in your class too um, and so you may have gone from a model where you are on a more traditional grading scale and now you're on pass fail. Um, you may have gone virtual for a sporadic amount of time, whatever it might be. Um, we, please keep in mind that your counselor will be sending a letter on your behalf. So it's going to come in with the school report that is coming from your high school. And also the counselor recommendation is going to tell us a little bit more about who you are as a student at your school in context. So I think it's also good to know, especially in this time, um, that you want to introduce yourself to your guidance counselor if maybe you haven't met yet in this virtual platform. It's good to just have maybe a half an hour conversation where you can talk about what you've done at the high school and what you would like to do in the future so that your guidance counselor has something to say about you uh, in that letter 
other than you know your GPA or what your rank might be if you have rank at your high school. So it's just good to know a little bit about you personally within the context of your high school. The other thing too is that we require two teacher recommendation letters. So I've actually put on the slide what we tend to look for when um, students say, who should, ask, who should I ask for my letter of recommendation from teachers? It should be from a teacher in an academic subject. So English, social studies, math, foreign language tends to be where our teacher letters of recommendation will come from. And if you can think about this process, that all the things that we review, really then what we are trying to find out is what type of student have you been in the past and imagine what type of student you're going to be at Boston College. And so these teacher letters of recommendation really help us to understand what you're like in the classroom. So do you turn in your homework on time? What are you like when you're participating with other students? Are you someone that volunteers to <laughs> help the teacher or um, you know, help your peers or something like that? And you just wanna think about someone that can write a letter of recommendation for you as a teacher um, that can talk about those qualities of you as a student in the classroom. So that's one thing I would just, uh, a tip about um, teacher letters. Uh, we also will ask that you have a mid-year grade report. That is a requirement um, for the school that they will handle that. And also the more information, the better, especially this year um, about any changes in classes or grades, it's always good for us to know that in our review process too. The uh, last thing is for students that are planning to apply to an art major. So that might be studio art, theater, uh, maybe an instrument, music, that type of thing. Um, we would uh, really encourage students to submit whether it's a portfolio or a sample through something that we have uh, called Slide Room. And that can go, um, you can upload that onto the rest of your application. If you are interested in doing something artistic or in the arts at Boston College, that's great. If you're not applying for the direct major, please don't use that Slide Room feature um, because that's for students that are having that as part of their academic review. So you can put that in your application in a different way. Maybe additional information or that type of thing, your activities, whatever it might be. Okay, so I saw some questions about this um, out of the corner of my eye uh, while Cindy was talking. So one big thing obviously that has been impacted is activities. And this is just the year where I think that we had plans for things that should have been going on in the spring and the summer and now the fall. And I know that you've probably worked very hard to have maybe an internship or different activities um, set up so that you can have different experiences, whether that's in your academic subject or just for fun. And we know that so many of those have been canceled at this time. And so please don't feel as though uh, we're expecting to see things be there as they would have been if the pandemic hadn't happened. So just keep in mind um, that we know that this is the age of things being canceled and disappointment. And so you might want to take this opportunity to talk about what really is important to you and how you have been able to go on and, and move forward um, in, in having these interests and activities be canceled. And what did you do instead? Or you're welcome to also tell us what you were supposed to do, what the intention was, uh, especially for something like internships, or if you're doing research, or if you have a job, um, all of that has really, really changed. And I think um, putting on your application in that activity section, what you really value and what is important to you, is also a great way to get to know you as we were talking about earlier. Even if it's not exactly as you planned, I think you can still explain your interests um, just in a little bit of a different way. So don't worry too much about that. The other thing I will just say too um, is that we know that with everything that has happened, some students have also dealt with something like a family illness, or you're in a household where you're helping siblings to learn online while you're also going to school. Um, and so I think you, all of those factors that may have come up that wouldn't have come up in, in you know, the way that things uh, were going, 
it's okay to put that on your application as well. We know that you are trying to be the best student that you can, but you're also trying to be the best family member that you can or the best friend that you can. And so we will definitely take that into account when we're looking at all those different activities is that you may have new responsibilities um, because of everything that's happened with COVID-19. Okay, and so we can talk a little bit more about the impacts of COVID-19 on uh, our admissions process and that type of thing. This year on the common application, there is going to be a section, I believe it's 250 words, where you can write about anything that has happened to you that has impacted your learning because of circumstances of COVID-19. So this could be something like a family illness in your household. It could be something like you'd never had access to internet or maybe you had internet only for a certain amount of time. And anything that would impact you being able to take your classes, write your papers, complete your studies, those are all the types of things that we are looking for in this writing section. Everyone has been impacted in COVID, uh, from COVID-19, of course, but I think that this section specifically is more about those types of factors and circumstances that would cause any significant changes to your learning. So not so, so much just that everyone went online because everyone is facing that as well, but, but more of those specifics. We also do have a frequently asked questions page on our website. I would highly encourage you to take a look at the frequently asked questions because we do update them and we are following very closely everything that students have been facing as far as challenges, as far as tests being canceled, as far as grades changing, as far as courses changing. We know that all of that is going on. And so we do update, update that website as frequently as we can so that you're able to look through that question and answer section and say, okay, I've had this challenge and this is how Boston College is going to look at it or going to handle it. Um, so I would definitely encourage you to take a look at that. All right, uh, the other thing is, uh, we do have a couple of deadlines that we just wanna make you aware of. So Boston College does offer early decision one and two. Early decision is a binding agreement. So when you apply for early decision to Boston College, you are saying to Boston College that it is your first choice school and that if you are admitted through early decision that you will attend Boston College and withdraw all your other applications. And I think that it's just good to know that really early decision is that first choice opportunity. So it is the best way that you can demonstrate your interest for Boston College, but it really, really is for students that have BC as their number one choice. We also do have regular decision. Um, you can see the deadlines are on the slide. So for early decision one, it's November 1st, which right now feels um, like it's right around the corner for us, but it's a couple of weeks away. Um, early decision two is January 1st and the same as regular decision. So um, we also do have uh, merit-based scholarships. I saw someone was asking questions about that. We actually only have one merit-based scholarship. It's called the uh, Gabelli Presidential Scholars Program. You do have to apply by November 1st to be considered for this scholarship. We typically award 15 of those scholarships per year. So it is a very competitive scholarship, but it is there. Uh, you can apply as a regular decision or regular, uh, I'm sorry, early decision or regular decision applicant. It's not that you're automatically considered early decision if you apply by that November 1st deadline. You do have to do an early decision agreement and that type of thing to apply early decision. So I saw one question about that. You can be both, but you do have to uh, apply by that November 1st deadline. The other thing too uh, that you just wanna keep in mind is that Boston College um, does have an Office of Financial Aid. So, and we are a need blind uh, review process and institution. So that means that our Office of Financial Aid and our admissions office are separate. So when we review our applications, it's two different departments. So you wanna keep in mind that when you're submitting something like your FAFSA and CSS profile, for whether you're early decision or regular decision, that you have those deadlines in mind so that you get all of those documents in through the financial aid office. 
We also do have a net price calculator on the financial aid website. I would encourage you to take a look at that and um, maybe sit down and just put in the information um, the best that you can so that you're able to make that decision um, and have that in mind um, when you're applying to Boston College. For early decision, especially, I know that can be something where that binding agreement comes up with families um, and that net price calculator can be really helpful in trying to determine um, how you're applying to Boston College. Okay, Woo. so we got through a lot of information, Cindy, amazing. Yeah, I think Cindy. it's gonna, <laughs> yeah. I think um, now would be a great time to turn it over to the many, many questions that I've watched and out of the corner of my eye come up. So um, why don't you go first, Cindy? Yeah, absolutely. And I do want to highlight from that Gabelli Presidential Scholarship um, that you were talking about, Kaylin, that is available to all students. I saw a question that came through. It is available for students who are applying as domestic students, uh, as well as international students. So make sure that you have that November 1st deadline in your mind, on your planners, so you plan accordingly. Now, one question that's coming up here, Kaylin, is to what extent does BC consider demonstrated interest when reviewing applications? And thank you to Eleanor for asking that question. So we actually don't track demonstrated interest here at BC, but as Kaylin was mentioning earlier, we have early decision, which you can only apply early decision to, to one school out of all of the universities that offer it. So in that sense, it is the highest level of demonstrated interest that you can share with the Board of Admissions here at BC. And we do have those two separate rounds for ED. Excellent. All right. Um, so I saw a question from Sophia. Uh, thank you, Sophia, for your question. Um, when we pick a school within the college, is it possible to put a second choice in case you don't get into your first choice of the four schools? Thank you so much, Sophia, for bringing this up. I think that a lot of students have questions about the different um, majors that they can apply to in undergraduate divisions. And Cindy did mention we have four main undergraduate divisions. So um, you do have to know, even if you don't know what exactly you want to study yet, you do have to select one of the main undergraduate divisions. So even if you're kind of undecided, you're still not sure, you still have to know like which direction you're thinking of going in, whether it be um, arts and sciences, management, education, and nursing. We do not offer students to have um, a, a second choice. So you are applying to that undergraduate division and then you're selecting a major. So if you're very, very undecided, you may want to apply to arts and sciences as undeclared. Um, just because that gives you a little bit of flexibility. Um, and I think it was about, what, 30% of our freshman class typically comes in as undeclared. So you don't have to know quite yet. Um, and especially with our core curriculum, I think it's a nice way for students to be able to try different subjects before they um, declare that major in their sophomore year. One other thing I'll just say, too, is that because there are only a certain number of seats in each undergraduate division, we um, encourage students to apply to their first choice of their undergraduate division. So there are about, I, I'm just roughly estimating, for the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences, there are about 1,500 seats available each year, about 500 to 550 in the Carroll School of Management, and I would say about 100 to 120 um, with the uh, Connell School of Nursing and the Lynch School of Education and Human Development. So just so that you know that. Um, it's also very challenging for students sometimes to go from uh, a larger school into a smaller school if they're trying to change their major and have that undergraduate division be completely changed. So that's why we encourage students to apply to their first choice is because there isn't always that guarantee that you'll fully be able to go from one school into the other once you're already at Boston College but you can take minors. Um, I know the Carroll School of Management also have, has minors for non-majors. So there's a lot of opportunity to have that academic crossover, um, but it's good to keep that in mind when you're applying that you're choosing the undergraduate division of your first choice and the major, no second choice. 
<laughs> new this year, and, and I guess it relates to this question too, Kaylin, as you know, we have uh, the new human-centered engineering major within yeah. the College of Arts and Sciences. And this is actually the only major where you can select a second backup major because this cohort is going to be just 25 students. Uh, and so, you know, let's say you apply to that new human-centered engineering major, you can select a second major, but this is only for this particular major, given that we're only selecting 25 for this year. And for every subsequent year after that, it will be 50 students coming in for this cohort. So thank you so much, Kaylin, for that answer. I do see a question here from Kate related to pre-med and what are the chances for our students in the pre-med program to then, to then go into medical school? I'm so happy that you're considering Boston and Boston College as your possible uh, home away from home, Kate, especially when you're looking at medical school because we're surrounded by some of the top hospitals in, in the country, if not in the world. And so that certainly helps our students who are in the pre-med track to look for internships and jobs on the road. So here pre-med is a professional track, pre-professional track. You can study anything and be in the pre-med professional track and that gives you access to an additional academic advisor who helps you stay competitive for medical school down the road in terms of selecting classes, internships, uh, research that will help you build that curriculum as well as staying on track for uh, important deadlines and, and, and assessments like the MCAT. Now around 85% of us, our students who are in the pre-med track, 85 being uh, above national average, go into medical school. So that's certainly uh, something that we're very proud of here at BC. For those of you who are looking at law school, we also have pre-law here at BC and we have a, a law school as well at the graduate level. So similar to pre-med, pre-law will also give you access to an additional academic advisor to be able to build up your resume. Thank you, Cindy. All right. I saw a couple of, I'm going to combine some questions because um, there are so many questions. It's incredible. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for your questions. Um, okay, so a lot of students were asking about like IB exams, AP credit. So Cindy, maybe you and I can answer this together a little bit because I know, um, especially this year, um, that tests were just canceled all over the world for all different types of things, AP exams, international baccalaureate exams. Um, and I just want you to know as students that we know that, we know that things have changed quite a bit. Um, one thing I would encourage you to look at on our website is that we do have an advanced placement guide on our website. And so it talks a lot about um, what would be considered as um, credit when you are coming in to Boston College based on the exams that um, you do have, or maybe, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how everything is going to move forward with everything that's changed, but we definitely know that those tests have been canceled, um, you know, for this year in many different ways. So it's a good idea just to look onto our website. Um, it will take you to a PDF, and you can look at, say, um, let's say you took AP Biology, you got a five, then that will be a certain amount of credit at Boston College for typically the core curriculum. For the most part, what we grant credit for is um, the subjects that would match with the core curriculum. So that would be like humanities, social science, natural science, foreign language. I know um, some students submit those. Both the AP and the SAT twos um, can be considered for credit as well as international baccalaureate exams, typically a six and a seven in higher level um, exams for the IB. Um, exactly. Just, oh yeah, <laughs> just, I would just familiarize yourself with that guide and also just know that at Boston College, sometimes we don't necessarily take away classes that you should be taking as part of the core curriculum or the credits that you have as a student at Boston College. Sometimes those AP exams or IP, IB exams can just be used for placement within something. So it's not always taking away something, but that's why you should look at the guide. Exactly, yes. I would encourage you to check out the guide. And as uh, Kaylin was saying, IB higher level scores of sixes and sevens, AP exam scores fours and fives. And you can also self-report these uh, scores for uh, AP exams, SAT subject tests. I know some questions came through about that. 
you can self-report that on the Common App. So that way we can, uh, if you have them, you know, that's another piece of information. As Kaylin was saying, the more information, the better for us to be able to uh, do the holistic review. There is a question here about, uh, do test scores need to be sent officially or can we self-report? Thank you, Mara, for asking that question. So we will request official test scores to be sent from College Board and the ACT in order for us to be able to have them added to your file. But we also accept uh, those standardized test scores if you have them. If they're self-reported on the transcript, that would also be accepted. And if they're coming from a school official like your, college, your high school college counselor, then we would also accept them and add, it, add them to your file. So I hope this helps as well. All right, thank you. I'm just looking through all the questions. Oh my gosh, I feel like we have talked quite a little bit about early decision. Um, I did see one student talk was asking about early decision and financial aid. I just wanted to go back to that in case um, I wasn't, I didn't talk about that enough with our slide that we had. Um, so I would encourage you if you are thinking about early decision, um, but you are looking at that financial piece as a big part of how you will be making your college decisions. If you go onto the net price calculator through the financial aid website, you can put in your information and family information um, and, and kind of get a sense of what your financial aid package would look like if you were to apply to Boston College. And so if you do that and you do it and you feel like this isn't necessarily something that I could commit to based on the numbers that you're seeing, we would encourage students at that point to apply for regular decision because then you're taking that binding piece away and you don't have to be anxious and stressed about that because we would never want students to be in a position um, where they were having that financial aid piece, you know, being so stressful and, and something that is really, um, you know, might be hurting the student more than helping them. So just keep that in mind when you're looking to apply um, that there's no difference as far as how we review our application for early decision or regular decision. Um, you really have to do what's best for you. Yeah, we're also getting some questions here about additional recommendation letters. So we talked about two recommendation letters coming from teachers and, co and core subjects. So that can be math, science, social studies, English, or foreign language. And then the other recommendation letter is coming from your counselors at the school. And all of them help us get to know you a little bit better, get to know your character in the classroom, outside of the classroom, what you're passionate about. So help them get to know you. Let's say you have an additional recommendation letter that you want to submit maybe because um, you have a supervisor who can write a fantastic recommendation letter on your behalf to showcase other skills that you've been able to learn in a job, for instance, then that's totally fine. I would always say that additional recommendation letters can sometimes, sometimes fill in the gaps for other layers uh, and identities that you are showcasing that are part of who you are. But certainly after, you know, having those Four recommendation letters. We know that you're a good student and a good kid, so I wouldn't go above and beyond uh, with our recommendation letters. Just try to meet what is required, and then if you think of someone else who might add some additional points, then that's totally fine, uh, but we certainly understand that sometimes that's difficult to be able to get more recommendation letters. So just the two required recommendation letters for the teachers and then the one coming from the counselor. All right, I'm still looking through all these questions coming through. Oh my goodness, amazing. We covered a lot of ground, I have to say, but there are, of course, there are always going to be questions that come up. Um, I would say a good one would be, um, I'm sorry, I'm still, I can, I'm trying to read and uh, I can't do two things at once. Okay, one thing um, that is on here, Cindy, that maybe we can go back to because it was on your slide. Um, does Boston College view unweighted and weighted rank differently? So I think in this uh, time period, especially as students have been home, their classes have changed, all of these different things. So how are we gonna look at the unweighted and weighted, like? GPA and rank, how do we typically look at that? Can you maybe talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah, absolutely. So we're not recalculating GPAs. We will go with what is offered on the transcript um, as it is reported by your high school. And so the high school and the school profile uh, in particular will give us an update in terms of the, the grading scale that the high school is using, um, if they're doing weighted or unweighted rank. And so all of that is available for us to be able to assess how this information is being presented and what that means within the context of your high school. So everything is taken at face value and then we're looking at the context of the school in order to assess you know we know the schools well we know the curriculum how have you been able to prepare yourself within the rigor of your high school to be at an institution a selective institution like bc so that's all information that we're collecting based on how your school is reporting it we're not recalculating anything or changing anything it's just taken at face value so certainly a great question and that will vary depending on the high school that you attend the curriculum that you have access to and whether your school ranks or not you know i have i read uh, applications from students in texas and at the public school level uh, for Texas, the high school will only report uh, students who are in the top 10% and that will be available on the transcript. So if they're not being reported, the student's not in the, top, in the top 10%. So that's information that I know because I read applications from that state and I am familiar with the schools in the area. But again, that's where, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful uh, for the fact that we have such an incredible, well, talented team here at BC in terms of the Board of Admissions uh, so that you know that you're in good hands when your application is being reviewed. There's also a question here, Kate, about uh, deferrals that have or might have happened uh, at BC due to the global pandemic and whether this will impact our future numbers as we are uh, right now talking to students and, and uh, recruiting students for for the future years um, so we actually didn't have a lot of students who deferred um, we offered students options in terms of being able to be in the hybrid model of taking classes on campus uh, with regulations uh, highlighted by the cdc as well as the state um, in terms of in-room capacity as well as online learning and so some students are also completely remote taking classes uh, from home remotely and so I think because of that, students were eager to continue their education at BC. And so we only received around 50 to 60 deferrals. And so that's certainly not going to impact uh, the number of students that we're looking for to start this freshman cohort. So it could be ranging from 2,300 to 2,400 or so students, but certainly um, the, the, the class uh, goals for this year, um, for this year's incoming class um, have not been impacted. So I hope, this helps answer that question. All right, thank you, Cindy. Um, I see a question here going back a little bit um, to what we were talking about on the um, factors of letters of recommendation and that type of thing is how do you know kind of who to ask um, and uh, what if I wanna submit an additional letter of recommendation? So this is my, my uh, best piece of advice on letters of recommendation. So you wanna definitely cover the basics when you're asking for letters of recommendation. So the two academic references from teachers that have had you as a student in the classroom. Now, some students ask, does it have to be a certain year? Does it have to be a certain subject? So if I wanna study, um, I think the student actually was uh, neuroscience. So if I wanna study neuroscience, do I have to have a, uh, uh, teacher letter of recommendation that comes from a science teacher that's referencing neuroscience and that type of thing. Of course, you can have that. It's something that I think students feel like they want to put that best foot forward in that subject area and that's great. Um, I will also just say that it can be also from a teacher that is a subject that is not your intended major. Maybe it's a, a teacher that had you in the classroom that maybe you actually were really challenged by and um, just to give you an example from my own personal life, when I was in high school, math and science were not my best subjects. I went on to major in English in college, um, but especially for something like algebra, I had a lot of trouble. And so I would have to go after school every day, meet with my teacher, I would have to go over my homework again. I worked really, really hard in that class. And even though I didn't have an A++ by the end, that teacher would be able to look at my performance in the class and say, you know what, Caitlin is not a stellar math student, 
but she worked really hard. And that B plus that you see, that is a really hard earned B plus. And I just want you to know um, that she put in the work and the time, she did her homework, she went above and beyond and really tried to work hard to understand the subject. And I'm proud of the hard work that she did. That is a great recommendation, <laughs> recommendation letter, um, even if it's not necessarily for the subject that you wanna study in college. The other thing too I would keep in mind is that please think about what you're putting in your application as far as additional letters and recommendations. If everyone put in two or three extra letters, we would never finish our <laughs> admission process and reading through all those applications. So if you're asking for an additional letter, whether it be something like a coach, um, if that is really what you feel strongly and say, I, if you feel like your application is incomplete without that letter of reference, absolutely that you can put that forward. But we would just ask that you be mindful of that when you're thinking about adding additional letters. Absolutely. And as we get ready to wrap up here, um, we have a couple of questions. I want to combine them all <laughs> just to get the answers here. So we don't okay. have early action here at BC. I know there was a question that came up. We have early decision and regular decision. And as you can see, the deadlines are on the screen right now. So if you don't want to be the, you, if you don't want to do the binding process uh, with admission to BC, then you can apply regular decision to BC. Now, if BC is your top choice school, you love it so much. You watch the football game today and you're super excited because we won and you're thinking ED, BC is for me. Then you can apply ED to, B, to BC. In terms of financial aid, you'll, you'll receive the same financial aid consideration when it comes to need-based financial aid. And if you're applying uh, by that November 1st deadline, then you're also being looked at for the Gabelli Presidential Scholars Program. So it is the same financial aid consideration for ED1, ED2, regular decision. But remember, you have to submit your documents on time in order for the financial aid office to be able to assess all of that information and put together a financial aid package. For need-based aid, we meet 100% of full demonstrated need. And as Kaylin was mentioning earlier, we practice need-blind admissions. So we never get to see your financial aid documents in order to make a decision on your file. We're looking at the other items that we address today. If you have questions about financial aid, we will encourage you to sign up for the financial aid conversation that's coming up as part of the Discover Boston College virtual open house events. You're gonna receive a lot of information from members of the financial aid office who will be joining that conversation. Also this year, we became a QuestBridge partner institution. So if you're applying through the QuestBridge uh, process, and you match with us through the college uh, national match uh, process, then we also will meet 100% uh, of your tuition needs. And so again, make sure that you're checking out QuestBridge as well if you are a student who identifies as the first in their family to go to college coming from a low income background. Uh, there are many opportunities available here at BC for that. There are some questions, Kaylin, coming in about the Gabelli Presidential Scholarship. And I think after this question, we can wrap up with our remarks, uh, but maybe yeah. you can help me answer this question okay. here. Okay. Uh, sure. what, are, what are we looking for? You know, are there any memorable uh, student stories that stand out for you when you're assessing with the Board of Admissions, the recipients for the Gabelli Presidential Scholarship? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, well, I think that for the most part, we are obviously seeing students that are, you know, in the top of their class that are taking the most challenging courses available to them in their program. But it's it goes beyond that, Cindy. I think it really is for students that are maybe thinking a little bit differently. Maybe they've decided to invent something. Maybe they have done something extraordinary within their hometown. Maybe they've done an incredible amount of service. Maybe they have really just stood out in their community as a leader and as an innovator or um, you know, someone that is, is really making a difference within their own community in whatever way um, you know, they're able to really use their gifts to make the world a better place. So I think um, that is something that is, we will consider in our review process is that as a Gabelli Presidential Scholar at Boston College, you also will be doing um, a, a big research thesis that spans across uh, several semesters. Typically, they also do travel over the summer and they do a study abroad. So um, I think it's a really um, intellectually 
um, engaging program, but you're also thinking about that leadership component and how you can think deeper about the topics that um, you're learning about and really become an expert in something uh, as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Definitely being a men and woman for others and already showing us that yes. through your application uh, <laughs> yeah. beyond the academic highlights for sure. Definitely. Yeah. So we're getting ready to wrap up here, uh, okay. Kaylin. And I know, you know, some that students might be wondering how can they continue the conversation? So we have our contact information here, but certainly each one of you has uh, an, an admissions counselor in our office who is dedicated to uh, reviewing applications from your high school. So if you go online on the admissions website, you can search by just typing in the name of your high school and it, it will give you the name and email of your admissions counselor and continue the conversation. Again, we don't track demonstrated interest, but we certainly would love to answer questions for you as you dive into this process. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Cindy. And uh, one other thing that you just want to keep in mind is that this presentation is actually part of a virtual open house. So there have been several events that have already happened and there are going to be more throughout the fall. So we would encourage you to sign up for more virtual events that are coming forward. But you can also go to um, our website and sign up for a virtual Eagle Eye session, which is basically an information session with real live students um, that we're running all through the fall. Uh, we also have a, a live campus tour for students that they can do. So there are a lot of ways to get involved and really learn more about Boston College, even in this virtual environment. And uh, we also have one-on-one -on -one conversations with students. There are a lot of different uh, great opportunities to learn more about BC. Absolutely. And without further ado, we just want to thank you all so much for your questions, your time today. We know we were not able to get through all of the questions, but please email, email us. All of our information is here on the screen as well as on the website, and we are more than happy to get back to you. And again, this, this information session right here, this, uh, this session is being recorded, so you'll be able to reference it later on. Uh, but without further ado, thank you, Kaylin, for joining me today for this conversation and for your, you your so knowledge, much. your expertise. Yours uh, too. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. And just one last thing just before we end. So Cindy mentioned everyone has a regional representative at Boston College. So typically at this time, my colleagues and I would be traveling to different high schools for college fairs and that type of thing. So if you have a particular question that's about your school or that's about the curricula that are available or that type of thing, or maybe something that's going on in your state, don't hesitate to reach out to your um, personal admissions representative to ask uh, questions. But of course, Cindy and I are here for you as well if you have any questions along the way. So thank you so much for joining us here today. We are so um, just grateful for your time, for your thoughtful questions, amazing, amazing questions. Thank you for being here. And um, thank you, Cindy, for a great presentation. And we hope that you are doing well. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of your Saturday. And thank you again. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.